Today's reading will be uh, from Acts 16, <coughs> verses 16 to 40. Once, when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She had earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. She followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul, came, uh, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the, author face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrate and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowds joined in the attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them into, in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open, and everyone's chains came loose. The jailer woke up. When he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, Don't harm yourself! We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds and immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. When it was daylight, the magistrates sent their officers to the jailer with the order, release those men. The jailer told Paul, the magistrates have ordered that you and Silas be released. Now you can go, now you can leave, go in peace. But Paul said to the officers, they beat us publicly without a trial, even though we were Roman, even though we are Roman citizens, and threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No, let them come themselves and escort us out. The officers reported this to the magistrates, and when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens, they were alarmed. They came to appease them and escorted them from the prison, requesting them to leave the city. After Paul and Silas came out of the prison, they went to Lydia's house, where they met with the brothers and sisters and encouraged them. Then they left. Thanks, Stephen. Um, my name is Josh. I'm one of the elders here at Christchurch, um, and I'm going to uh, be speaking on that passage. And welcome to those watching at home or watching later on in the live stream. It'd be great for, for you and everyone here to have that passage open in front of you. Um, because I am going to draw your attention to quite a few bits in it. But before um, we come to uh, look at that passage, I'm going to pray for God's help. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you've spoken to us in your word. And we pray this morning that as we open your word and read it, as we come to hear the words your spirit has inspired, that this wouldn't be just hearing from a book, but this would be hearing from you. And we pray that um, in all we see, we would see Christ and that you would uh, make a difference in our lives, that we would become more Christ-like and more um, worshippers of Christ as a result. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, barely um, a day goes by these days uh, without me hearing something on the news about um, a protest or a vigil somewhere. Um, I'm guessing you might have heard in recent months of the um, 
Those protesters who protest by sitting down on motorways and close down all the motorways. I read this week about a protest of people on London Bridge, dangling off London Bridge on some ropes. Um, the other day I walked past a picket just outside Liverpool University. I'm guessing some of the staff must have been on strike. But even more gravely, um, there are often vigils for murdered women. And there's protests about a war in Ukraine asking the government to do something. All of these things are pointed to the fact that our world is broken. But protests and vigils are also pointed to the fact that we know there are systems in place in our nation which overlook the vulnerable and protests say we want to challenge that. That's not okay. Protests say that some of society is built on people taking advantage of other people because they can, and that's how things work, but we're not okay with that. We want to put a stop to that. And protests are what we resort to because we feel so much like the answer doesn't lie in our own hands, but it lies with the powers that be. That the answer to the problem is not so much a change that you and I can make, but a movement. And we're going to see in Acts today that the earliest Christian believers were also passionate about challenging systems that took advantage of the vulnerable. They were passionate about challenging evil in the world. But what we're going to see in Acts 16 today is not that they did that by rallies and protests, not that there's anything wrong with them, um, but actually the way that they, that they confronted evil was just through the, the lives that loved God and loved justice. And by loving God and loving justice, their lives came naturally into conflict with a society that loved wealth and power. And in Act 16, we're going to see stories of extraordinary transformation in the city where these Christians are staying, in Philippi. And yet, that transformation comes through lives that are shaped like Jesus. Lives of integrity and compassion that lead to suffering and bearing a cost, and that leads to them loving their enemies, shining a light in darkness, and speaking up. There are three, if you've got the passage open, but we're gonna follow three sort of episodes, three different events that happen in the narrative. And as you see all three, I hope you'll be encouraged at the difference that Jesus-shaped lives can make in dark places. It begins as Paul and Silas are on their way uh, through the city and they meet a slave girl and where Jesus people live like Jesus among people treated cruelly we see in the evil liberation in the evil liberation um, at the moment right this moment right this minute in the UK uh, there are an estimated 136,000 at least 136,000 people who are actually in the UK and are slaves, who are victims of what we call modern slavery. It is actually the same as slavery. Um, and that happens as some people who are in poverty in other countries are promised a better life, a job um, and freedom. And so they're brought to this country, but instead of giving, uh, giving a life and a job, they are forced to work in factories or car washes or kitchens. They're forced to do that through psychological manipulation or threat of violence. There are some people who are enslaved, not because they've been brought here, but because they were already here, but they've been groomed and manipulated into a community or a gang where they have to perform crime to be in this community. And there's a sense of belonging if they stay and there's a threat of death if they leave. And other people are slaves having fled war at home. They fled terror. They've left their house and their relatives. And when they meet some people here, they're offered money to support themselves while they're here. Money if they make sex videos to put online. And if they ever think about stopping, well, they'll be turned into the police. They'll be exposed. They'll be sent home. See, there are people who prey on the vulnerable and realise that when people are desperate, you can make money from them. Now, you'd think that our culture is sophisticated enough to be able to say that is awful. We want that to stop. But the truth is, those sex videos get hundreds of thousands of watches. And there are plenty of local councils who are really, really reticent 
They're hesitant to intervene in the gangs or the brothels because they know that those activities can be managed rather than stopped. And that's simply because it's easier to make allies with people who are trafficking others than to make enemies of them. If that's Liverpool, well then Philippi in our passage isn't very much different to the country we live in. Because Paul and Silas, they bump into a woman and she is a victim of slavery. She is a slave because she's been exploited because she's got a satanic spirit. She's vulnerable. She's not got a voice except the voice that the satanic spirit gives her. And the, her owners realise that this is an opportunity. An opportunity to get rich. Paul and Silas meet her because the satanic spirit inside her causes her to hijack their ministry. She's shouting out, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Now to us, that might sound okay. That sounds like what they are doing. Um, and there is truth in that. But as with any corruption, as with any lie, it's based on truth. Now to Greek sounding ears, or to Greek ears, or to the Roman ears who know about Greek culture, the Most High God is how you'd speak about Zeus. And certainly if Paul and Silas have got a ministry that is endorsed by a satanic spirit. It really starts to confuse what the message is that they're doing. It really starts to confuse people about this ministry. So here in the midst of evil, there's a girl who's a victim of exploitation. There's a cruel society that says that's actually fine. That's an economy. That's an industry. And what she says is beginning to confuse the message of Jesus out in the society. It's a dark place, but in the evil... Jesus is present. The book of Acts is not a book about Christian heroes or the history of the birth of the church. The book of Acts is a book about Jesus. It's a book about what Jesus is doing. He's ascended into heaven, but he's still doing work on earth. And he's doing it through his spirit-filled people as his agents. And in this passage, through his spirit-filled people, people living like Jesus, Jesus is there. And he stretches out a hand of compassion. And Paul uses Jesus' name and says, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the Spirit left her. In the evil, liberation. Jesus' people in this city encounter cruelty and oppression and act on Jesus' behalf to bring compassion Jesus' people are confronting evil and speaking out for good. And it does bring liberation. There's a good end to this story. Now, you'd think that this would be well received in Philippi. It's a sophisticated city, by the way. It's not much different from Liverpool. There are people there with uh, important jobs. It's a Roman colony. They're connected to the global industry and economy. Um, and the people in Philippi are middle class um, slightly wealthy people, they are, they're good people. And you'd think that in the face of this happening, the spirit leaving the girl, they'd say, wow, look, here is a team of people who are an advocate of human rights. They are bringing justice. Isn't that great? They're doing good in our city. There is justice to the oppressed. Satan is driven away. Slaves are being freed. All this is brilliant. Except the problem is, it was an industry. <laughs> And it was generating a little bit of money. And everyone sort of relied on that. And everyone, except the slaves, kind of got along quite, quite fine with this being the industry. Jesus' people, confronting evil, tends to have a knock-on effect on the status quo. And it gets Paul and Silas into trouble. Notice, though, if you're familiar with Acts, you might be expecting Paul to get in trouble for speaking about Jesus. And you might have that fear in your own life that you, you don't really want to um, say too much that's going to ruffle feathers. You know that you're worried that you might get rejection or criticism for sharing your views about what the Bible says, for speaking. But actually here, Paul and Silas are not in trouble for speaking their views. They're not doing anything controversial whatsoever. They're in trouble for doing what is absolutely right and what would probably be right in everybody's eyes. Jesus' people confront evil. And even without saying anything controversial, even though the principle of freeing slaves sounds good, even though plenty of those people in Philippi would love to see Paul and Silas's 
uh, Twitter feeds and Instagram posts saying what they're doing for the good of everybody, and that would be celebrated. The truth is, doing what is right, actually putting that into practice, to help the marginalised, give a voice to those who don't have a voice, that never goes down well. Because there are systems and economies that rely on that. Let me give you an example in our own world that I read just the day before yesterday. And by the way, I'm not saying this because I'm banging a drum on an issue or um, want to kind of whip up you, you up into activism or to uh, give a particular criticism on one issue. I'm just illustrating how this actually is really the case in our world today. I was reading about a group who is concerned about um, children being brought into gambling addictions because of um, gambling advertising that seems to appeal to them. And words and phrases and everything in gambling that makes children get into it, and also concerned about the effects of gambling addiction on adults. And this group has been lobbying to ban all gambling advertising and sponsorship in football. And in response, the Football League said that to do that would leave a £40 million hole in its club's finances each year. In other words, I don't mind the idea. In other words, it sounds all very good and noble, but we kind of are relying on the income that brings. We kind of need this to happen for things to function. So Jesus is at work in the world in Philippi. He's working at the, in the world through Christians to act on behalf of the vulnerable. But this idea of freeing slaves, even today, we're not particularly keen on it. We kind of rely on the benefits that cruelty brings. Freeing slaves is bad for business. So back in Philippi, the slave owners decide to stitch up Paul and Silas on some vague charges, um, and they appeal, really, um, not so much to what Paul and Silas are doing, but to just the racial prejudices in the crowd, and they suffer brutality for bringing liberation into the evil. They suffer, they're beaten, and thrown into jail. There's very much a Jesus-like ministry going on here, to do what's right, to take up the cause of the vulnerable, and yet that comes with a cost. Um, from now on, I'm going to need to um, have the slides moved on at the back, Tom, because um, that one's not working. Um, so the next slide. Um, there is a cost, but this is just like Jesus. Just like I was saying in the kids' talk, copying Jesus means doing what is right and suffering for it. If their ministry is Jesus-shaped, then they get put into the darkness, into the cell, into the tomb. But if their ministry is Jesus-shaped, we know there must be hope. And there is, because in the second section, picking up from verse 25, in the darkness, there is life. Um, when I worked as a science teacher at one point, I um, was in a college where the science department was quite small, and so I was called upon to help to interview for a new lab technician. So I said, okay, yeah, I'll, um, I'll come up with some questions. Um, and I said, well, actually, why don't we, for the interview, why don't we have a, um, like a practical aspect to it? I'll get them to perform a titration. We'll see how they get on, test their science skills. Now, I said that because I'd seen that done at the college I was at before. So I thought, if you're going to be a science technician, you probably... This is par for the course. This is what you'd come to expect. Other colleges are doing this. This is probably the level of skill expected for science technicians. So we'll, we'll get them to do the titration. That should be fine. But actually, I really wish I hadn't have asked them to do it because I felt so cruel because none of them could do it. None of them had a clue what they were doing. I don't know if the quality of candidate was quite low or if I just set the bar too high or if I had just copied something from somebody else that really wasn't going to work in our situation. And I felt so sorry for these poor people. On their big interview day, the day they told their friends about, oh, I've got an interview, the day they got dressed up smart for to come to their interview, and I'm giving them this thing that they just totally can't do. They can't produce any decent results. It's a complete embarrassment. They were probably thinking, well, thanks so much for all of these instructions. I have actually followed them. I've tried to do what you asked, and I'm not really sure that I've done anything wrong, except it's just ended up as one big failure. And I wonder if that is how Paul and Silas were tempted to feel at verse 24 and 25. They uh, have been following Jesus' lead. It's probably, it's earlier on in the chapter, probably just a few weeks earlier, Jesus had given Paul a really clear vision that he wanted them in Macedonia. So they followed what Jesus is saying. They followed Jesus' lead into Philippi. 
And they're being like Jesus in, in liberating exploited slaves. And then their ministry comes to an abrupt end. Because they're beaten and they're in prison and they're not getting out. They listen to Jesus. They're Jesus' agents in the world. They've done what was right. And having done what was right, they're now in a big mess. Black eyes and cracked ribs and open wounds that are not going to heal but get infected. And then there's a cr cruel and cold-hearted jailer, a thug with a club, who deliberately puts them, their feet in the stocks in the inner cell so that they can't sit right, they're not going to sleep tonight, and they're not going to get to rest their wounds. They probably do feel a bit frustrated at that, but they actually, they know enough about the Jesus who's called them. They know enough about his story that in the darkness, Jesus does bring life. They know that Jesus definitely is in charge and Jesus is their treasure. And if Jesus is their treasure, they love to be like him. They love to copy him. And what has happened to them has made them look more like Jesus. And it certainly hasn't ruined anything. And we're going to see why, because then in verse 30, uh, 26, there's an earthquake. And all the prison doors fly open and everyone's chains come loose. And then in the darkness comes the moment of life. We realise that it wasn't the darkness for Paul and Silas. It was the darkness for the jailer. He wasn't a slave with a slave master, but he was under merciless employers who really would show him no mercy if any of those uh, prisoners escaped. He was going to face death. And in his darkness, he drew his sword to kill himself. And yet in the darkness, life Paul sees the opportunity to be Jesus again, to love his enemy, to love the man who's just put him in those chains. And he says to him, don't harm yourself. We're all here. Now, we don't know whether the jailer was a spiritual man. We don't know whether he'd heard Paul and Silas preach before, whether he was already interested or not. But we do know that here in the darkness, he encounters great mercy and love from men he'd been brutal to. There was a way out of the cell for Paul and Silas, and they turned that into a way out for that jailer to bring life into the darkness. The jailer had seen that the God who'd made a way out for Paul and Silas could be the God who'd give him a way out, because he, he was a God who brings life and liberty where there's death and fear. And so Paul and Silas get to share the message of Jesus with him, and the fear that nearly led him to suicide turns to joy. In verse 34, when he hears and believes the message of Jesus, and you know, there's something really amazing here. Um, <clears throat> just cast your eyes forward, if you've got the passage open, to verse 35. And notice that actually the next day, the magistrates were going to release Paul and Silas anyway. And I think God knew that. So why on earth would God need to bust them out of prison in the middle of the night, if he knows that they're going to be released in the morning anyway? Why on earth would God have his people beaten and put in prison, if he knows that they're just going to be out within 24 hours? Unless God had a plan to reach that man in darkness, to reach the jailer, to put Jesus right under his nose, to get Paul and Silas to do good, to suffer for doing good, to be chained up in darkness, so under the jailer's nose would be a model of suffering, death, and resurrection. And I take it, this was just there for the jailer to bring him into the kingdom of God. And it's written down in our Bibles, to encourage Christians and later generations, people like you and I, that even though our calling is to do right, and even though that calling to do right is also then a calling to suffer, we can be encouraged that as Christians love their enemies in the dark places and suffer to be able to bring Jesus to them. Well, that's how Jesus builds his church. In the darkness, there is always life. And then in the next morning... In the daylight, justice. At this point, there's good news. The jailer's off the hook. Um, the prisoners can be released, so he's not going to be held accountable for their disappearance. So that's good. And the good news as well is that Paul and Silas can go back to sharing Jesus with people and doing their Bible studies. So you'd have thought at this point in verse 35, 36, Paul and Silas get to go free and off they go and go back to the ministry they were doing. But verse 37, Paul pipes up. He says... They beat us publicly without a trial. 
even though we are Roman citizens and threw us into prison. And now, do they want to get rid of us quietly? No! Let them come themselves and escort us out. Now, we know that Paul is really insistent elsewhere in the Bible that Christians don't have to stand on their rights if it means that they can speak Jesus to somebody. So why is he making a stink here? Well, here's why. Um, and it's got to do with railings. <laughs> um, in my old primary school, <clears throat> there are some... Uh, there, there was a, a plant room down in a basement, and you get to it from outside. So you have to go down some steps outside, down to a, a, an outside stairwell to get in. And, and around the steps was a small wall. And on that wall, there are some railings, known locally as Josh's railings. <clears throat> um, I say known locally. I'm the only person who refers to them as Josh's railings. Um, but they are there because... On the 1st of June, 1992, one of the, the bright, eager, handsome year two pupils was standing on that wall without railings, and he had a slip. And I don't remember much about what happened next, but I remember walking up those steps, bleeding quite a lot from my head, and six-year-old me had to be rushed to hospital to get stitches. Now, once I was better, I thought, let's just get back to normal. But somebody at the school must have been thinking a bit like Paul. They must have been thinking, hang on, that shouldn't have happened. What if that happens again, but this time it's worse? There is a duty of care here. We can't just leave it. There's got to be a system in place to make sure this doesn't happen. We've got to put that right. That's my story of Josh's railings, and that is how I think Paul was thinking as well. Once he's released, he knows that the society does contain evil, but he also knows that in that society there are provisions in the Roman law, provisions that should have stopped that from happening. And he knows that if he just turns around and heads off out of Philippi, he's leaving behind the jailer and the other believers, and there's nothing stopping them from, from being beaten up on frivolous charges, thrown into prison, and that becoming the norm in that city. But even Roman law says that that shouldn't be happening. So, for the sake of those young believers in Philippi, for the sake of the little church, Paul takes a stand for justice. Because he knows that if, if Jesus is building his church, then he knows that anyone standing against it will one day be exposed and disgraced. And Paul gives a glimpse of that here because he calls out the city rulers publicly and gets it on record that they've not been upholding justice. And I wonder whether this scene where the celebrated city officials and their secretaries and the guards are walking respectfully behind Paul and Silas through the streets. I wonder if that scene is there to give, us, to, to give the, the, the local Christians the, the confidence that although they are in the midst of evil, and although there is slavery and corruption and prejudice all around, there is a God who's in charge. And Jesus is the boss of those rulers. So here in Philippi, as Christian, Christianity takes root, people who love, God, who love what God loves and do what is right, they come into conflict with a society that loves the benefits of, the tramp, of trampling on the vulnerable. But the way that Christians live in that sort of society is very, very Jesus-shaped. And that's the way it's going to be in any city. That's the way it's going to be in Liverpool. Christians living Jesus-shaped lives. Because we at Christ Church, we follow the Jesus, the same Jesus whose life was constantly spent with those without a voice. Jesus always lived his life with the blind, the disabled, the national traitors, that's the tax collectors, with the poor, with the ceremonially unclean, like lepers and women with bleeding, and the prostitutes. He was there where evil was embedded in society and where Satan's spirits tormented the vulnerable. And Jesus would always step into the evil and bring liberation. That's a Jesus we follow. That's a Jesus whose, lives, whose life our lives will mirror. But as Jesus did that, we know that what sounded good on paper actually upset the powerful. And out of jealousy, 
He was arrested, charged on frivolous accusations, and beaten. But unlike Paul and Silas, his, his end wasn't to be thrown in a prison. His darkness wasn't a prison cell, but was the darkness of a tomb. And yet, unlike Paul and Silas, he wouldn't bring life in the darkness through saving one man. But by his death, he would save the world. Because his death was actually on our behalf. And so in Jesus' story, in the darkness, there is life when God threw open the tomb with an earthquake. And now the risen Jesus comes in love to those who persecuted him, to those who hated him, even to those of us who would rather not listen to him. He comes in love to us with his wounds and he offers us salvation. And he says, through his people, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, verse 31, and you'll be saved. And he will come again one day to bring justice in the daylight, we know that one day Jesus will be conquering the greatest global forces for the sake of his little watching church. I love how Jesus shaped the ministry of Paul and Silas is here in Philippi. <clears throat> and that's a picture God has given us of what our lives will be like in Liverpool. It's not a very British thing to, to want to go and ruffle some feathers. But quite often, doing what is right will do that. And that's our calling. Not to go and make enemies, but to do what is right. You'll make plenty of enemies by doing that. And for some of us, that might look like involvement in campaigns to challenge modern slavery. It might look like writing to your MP every time there's a vote on an issue that in includes um, abortion or death at the end of life. It might be writing to your child's school to question the teaching on sex for the five-year-olds. It's right, and we can speak about it. But it might make you enemies. But that makes you Christ-like. But it also might look more ordinary. It might look more ordinary when you always choose the path that is right. You're the only one in the office who doesn't lie about certain results. Or you call someone out on a derogatory mark about somebody who's disabled. You do the Jesus thing and you do what is right. But we're called to suffer for that. The Bible speaks today to tell you that that won't go down well because there are systems that rely on putting others down. But if the consequences come back to you, if the consequences of a cold shoulder or being people criticising your views or being labelled, and actually Paul and Silas kind of set the, put the ceiling quite high here, if, even if the consequences of being put in prison come back to you, you know that you are being a Jesus model. You're being Jesus in that situation by suffering for it. So in the evil, work for liberation. And that might lead to darkness, but you know that Jesus uses darkness to bring life. And we know in the daylight there is justice because Jesus is the Lord of our city. There is brokenness in our world of protests. But imagine... Seeing lives transformed as Jesus-shaped people and Jesus-shaped lives that do right, bear the cost, and see life and joy in darkness. And, and have the confidence to do all of that because Jesus will bring justice in the daylight one day. Imagine that in our city. And imagine that day when we'll be like that Philippian church watching as Jesus is the one who brings justice in the daylight. And the powers and authorities are walking speechless behind the conqueror. That's a Jesus-shaped Christian that I want to be.